As is the tradition in our country as well, I'd like to begin by acknowledging on behalf of the Aboriginal Housing Management Association in British Columbia, Canada, the Larakia people as the traditional landowners of the Darwin Territory. And we would also like to graciously give thanks to and respect to the Larakai elders, people, past and present, for welcoming us here to do our good work. Thank you. In the language of my ancestors, Ni'it, hello. My name is Margaret Foe. I am the Chief Executive Officer for the Aboriginal Housing Management Association. I know that since I've been here, I've had the pleasure and opportunity to speak to uh, the Aboriginal Housing Office members and board uh, and learned a, quite, a, quite a lot of history here in Australia, as well as meet with some of our New Zealand counterparts. And, uh, you know, I understand that there are more in common that unite us then divide us as a people. And as Elder Ellen said, united we stand, divided we fall. And while I'm here to share with you the experience in Canada, there is so much that has happened that is the same for us as Indigenous peoples. And so it's important that when we start to talk about solutions, we understand that we're talking about an international phenomenon where colonization has impacted Indigenous peoples in any part of this world. I also would like to thank the young Tiwi singers for their beautiful opening. That was uh, inspiring. I also would like to thank Senator Melandieri uh, for your words as well. It certainly sounds like we have a lot in common, both as Indigenous peoples as well as our fight with government uh, of all levels to understand that solutions for Indigenous people need to be led by Indigenous people. We need to be at the table. So AMA is a leading voice that supports, advocates, and responds to the needs of our Indigenous housing providers in British Columbia and the Indigenous communities that they serve. We were founded in the early 1990s by Indigenous housing providers who wanted to make meaningful change within their communities, and in large response because the Government of Canada in the 1990s decided that they no longer had a responsibility from a housing solution focus to address Indigenous peoples across the country, and they ceased their funding models for Indigenous housing and devolved those to the provinces. And our organization, uh, we came together as a number of 23 housing providers who said that if you're going to devolve these programs, you need to devolve them to us, the experts who know what's happening in our communities. And we were fortunate that the province of BC agreed with that because the federal government had no interest in discussing the administration of urban indigenous programs with a provincial organization. They wanted to deal strictly government to government with the province of BC, and the province of BC back in that day agreed that we should be at that table at all times. AMA's vision for the future was built on our members' histories of grassroots evolution and self-determination. AMA's vision aligns with the United Nations Article 23 that states Indigenous peoples have the right to be actively involved in developing and determining health, housing, and other economic social programs affecting them. So as I said, we are a provincial umbrella organization currently comprised of 41 members who are each Indigenous housing providers, and they have been meeting the needs of our displaced urban Indigenous peoples for nearly 50 years across the province and across the country of Canada. Our members serve over 5,000 Indigenous families across the province. Being direct partners with the provincial government is another way that we are in a very unique position and the first of its kind in the country of Canada, only second in the world to the Aboriginal Housing Office in New South Wales. We actually uh, had one of our CEOs travel over here to learn and listen uh, to the Aboriginal Housing Office in New South Wales to kind of pattern some of our policies and perspectives. So I'm not gonna go over all of the details. I'm not sure how visible this uh, evolutionary slide is for you, but I'd like to just open up our, our origin and our evolution with a quote that means a lot to us. I have walked that long road to freedom. I have tried not to falter. I have made missteps along the way, but I have discovered the secret that after climbing a great hill, one only finds that there are many more hills to climb. I have taken a moment here to rest, 
to steal a view of the glorious vista that surrounds me, to look back on the distance I have come. But I can only rest for a moment, for with freedom comes responsibilities, and I dare not linger, for my long walk is not ended. That was written by Nelson Mandela. And when I think about what I heard from the Aboriginal Housing Northern Territories, Bob and Barb and Elder Ellen and a number of others, you hear a fatigue, a tiredness at feeling like we've been fighting this battle for years. I've been doing this for 25 years. I tease people that my daughter, who's 26, her first word was not mama, it was ama, because that's how long I've been in this battle. So I understand that you feel tired. I understand that you feel like you're spinning in a wheel. But you will succeed and you will move forward. And it's the fortitude and the resilience of Indigenous peoples that will demonstrate as, as our countries grow, we are the leaders, we are the landowners, and we will still be here despite what has happened. In our evolution, as you can see from our timeline, this process did not happen overnight. And you know, I'd like to congratulate the Aboriginal Housing Northern Territory. They just received their certificate of incorporation after four years of working and coming together as, as people to fight for their rights. So congratulations to you. And after many discussions with CEO James and uh, the Aboriginal Housing, our brothers and sisters from Australia and New Zealand, as I said, there are many similarities and parallels. And rather than bore everyone with a play-by-play -play of the 25 years of our evolution, I'll simply summarize that our existence occurred and is, is sustained in its new iteration. I should let you know that our organization just converted from a member board, which we started 25 years ago, to a fully independent board of directors with the creation of a governance committee called the Natsamat Lelam, which in our language means one heart, one mind. That is a committee of three housing providers elected by the 41 housing providers in the province of BC to be the direct vehicle to the board of directors to ensure that our organization does not forget the grassroots with which we came from. So our new structure is that tenuous tightrope that all Indigenous organizations have to walk. We need to create credibility with the non-Indigenous government, but we also need to maintain the respect and trust of the grassroots people that we serve. And so our new governance structure that we just put into place last fall is less than a year in the making, but it's about being able to demonstrate to all parties that we have accountability and responsibility to our people. But the core foundation of AMA is the belief that solutions for Indigenous must be led and operated by Indigenous. You will hear later about the national organization, the Canadian Housing and Renewal Association. I sit as a board member on that as, and as an active participant on the Indigenous Caucus Working Group. We created a national report entitled the FIBI Report, which is for Indigenous by Indigenous. And I'm happy to share that with the uh, conference website uh, if you can't find it. Again, at the crux of this is the notion that any solution for Indigenous peoples had to be led by Indigenous peoples. So part of the core of what I want to speak about today are five key principles that found AMA in what we do and how we act. These perspectives are part of some of our biggest challenges and yet simultaneously are the foundations of each of our solutions. Complex yet simple and crucial to the work that our organization is wholeheartedly committed to because these perspectives are not just ideas and thoughts. They are all about the people. The how we work, the why we work, and the who we work for is our Indigenous people. The crisis we are facing in Canada and around the world is not just a housing crisis, because houses don't experience crises. People do. So the five areas that I'm going to talk about, reconciliation, Indigenous women and girls, Indigenous youth, the concept of for Indigenous, by Indigenous, and a concept we coined called leading the change. I thought this was an apropos slide. For those of you that may not be aware, in Canada, they created the Truth and Recon Reconciliation Commission. 
and uh, it's a commission that was tasked with discovering and revealing past wrongdoing by the government in the hope of resolving conflict left over from that past. To AMA, reconciliation begins with ourselves, then with one another, creating a respectful and authentic relationship no matter where we go. This is the official definition of reconciliation. I've had this conversation before. To me, reconciliation is just a word. It means nothing. It will do nothing. It is a word and just a word without action, without conscious thought and effort to affect the change. It is just a nice word. I would encourage you to look up a woman named Sharla Huber who works for one of our housing providers called Macola Housing in Victoria, British Columbia. She runs two programs, two educational programs. The first one called How Not to Check a Box. So it's beyond putting an Indigenous face on one of your articles or newsletters. It's beyond just inviting somebody to come here and do a presentation. It's about recognizing the sense of inclusion and the, insensi the sense of belonging that we as Indigenous people continue to battle for. The other program that she teaches is called Indigenous Relations. The creation of Indigenous relations is, again, beyond the simplicity of simply inviting an Indigenous person into your life or into your organization. It's about listening. It's about hearing, and it's about feeling, and it's about taking the time that it's going to take to rebuild trust that has been broken over years and years of systemic breakdown. So if you're interested, again, you can find the Makola Housing Group of Societies on our website. It's all about conscious thought and intent. Weave this into your daily lives and actions and we will see true reconciliation. The Truth and Reconciliation Canada provided 94 calls to action. AMA has been honoring these calls far before these were ever released. They are a part of our day-to-day -day business and interactions within all of our relations with all of our people, people communities, partners, and stakeholders. This is a picture of some of our founding members. Some of you may have met on the far side there in the glasses is Andrew Leach. He was our CEO for a number of times. He created the World Indigenous Housing Conference in 2012, which our brothers and sisters from Australia and New Zealand traveled across the pond to join us at that time. Uh, the center is a founding member, member, David Seymour, and the woman is June Later, she is also one of our founding members. Uh, she was just given an honorary doctorate from one of our local universities for all of her hard work in terms of working for urban indigenous people. So our members meet the unique needs of indigenous communities through culturally appropriate programs. We listen to our indigenous peoples. We listen to our indigenous voices, communities, traditions and knowledge and then respond to those with meaningful solutions. Our members meet these unique needs through culturally appropriate programming based on what we hear and witness every day. And these solutions fall along the entire housing continuum. As you can see, we have 35 different types of programming that our members offer and housing is just the start. AMA oversees and supports the full spectrum of housing from shelters, to supportive housing, to affordable housing, and into the market housing. The proof is in the pudding. We don't sit here and tout our expertise and our, our successes because our successes are our people's successes. Our successes is when our tenants can talk to us about how they feel safe, how they were able to focus on their health issues, how they were able to focus on their children, or how they were able to focus on getting an education or employment. So these next few slides are just a few examples of the supportive programs. Most of these uh, programs that we offer are listed on our website as well. In this picture here, Luann is one of our founding members and the tenant that she is hugging is Leanne, uh, who battles mental illness and without housing in Quinnell would have found herself homeless and on the street and lost in one of those invisible faces that we all walk past. You see here we have a men's focus program 
it's interesting because it's always easy to argue for women, it's always easy to argue for youth, but we often forget in a culture that's designed to teach our men to be strong and not to show their weakness, that we need to be having housing solutions that support our men that are struggling as well. In our workplace, as I said, we weave reconciliation through everything we do, and our staffing structure has evolved in response to what our communities have asked for, what they need. We are still learning, and we are still growing. In direct response to our community with regards to understanding Indigenous challenges uh, from the full spectrum of homelessness all the way to home ownership, we created two new roles in our company, one called the Indigenous Cultural Advisor, and the other, the manager of Indigenous strategic relations. In Canada, we have over 600 First Nations. Over 200 of those are in the province of British Columbia. And they are in the uh, midst of creating their own housing authority as well, called the Housing Infrastructure Council, British Columbia. And our job is to work with them and support them so that they succeed. We prioritize recruiting Indigenous pro professionals and we have over 60% of AMA staff that are Indigenous. Pictured here are a few of our strong Indigenous women in the AMA office and I'm happy to say that three of those women have all received promotions recently. Uh, our goal is to create capacity within and to support leadership and evolution. And I heard that when I talked with our uh, our leaders from the Aboriginal Housing Office, we need to be bringing in the younger generations and we need to be supporting them and promoting them so that they can take over, so that they can carry on this good fight for Indigenous people. That's a nice segue for our, one of our key focuses, which is our women and our girls. Many of you may know that there was a national inquiry launched in Canada because of the over-representation of our Indigenous women and girls going missing or murdered. And that's happening across the country. I understand that it's happening in other parts of the world where our Indigenous girls and our Indigenous women are treated as though they are disposable. Despite the fact that we understand women are our matriarchs, most of our Indigenous populations work under a matriarchal uh, system, we still find that mainstream community, by and large, sees our women as disposable. So the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls brought forth 231 calls to action and was released earlier this summer. I see that the slide isn't actually updated, but I did send a slide that has a link to the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Report. Uh, I'll make sure that that gets given to the uh, HURRY website before I leave. AMA has always embodied those calls as a core value. We continue to honor our women through culturally appropriate housing and ensuring Indigenous challenges are solved through Indigenous community-led solutions. So again, these next few slides share with you some of the programs that are led by Indigenous women for Indigenous women and children. Last year, I had the pleasure of sitting down with former Prime Minister Paul Martin. We talked about a passion of his which focuses on Indigenous youth. In our discussion, because we recognize that the Indigenous population is outstripping mainstream growth by four to one, that in the very near future, Indigenous youth will make up 20% of the Canadian workforce. Yet, we have more Indigenous youth in care which means they were taken away from their families, taken away from their communities and put into foster care than the non-Indigenous community. We cannot rely on the colonial government to make or create our solutions. So with our support, our community leaders and our housing providers have become creative in both housing and reconnecting our youth to their culture because we recognize that we cannot leave these youth unattended. If the entire Canadian workforce is going to re on, re rely on 20% of that population coming from the Indigenous youth, we need to act now. Our children are at the door and they cannot be left. 
So again, I encourage you to check out our website for links to some of these creative programs. We actually have six programs in the province of British Columbia that directly address our youth challenge. They are innovative programs that combine youth and elder housing that gives our youth a stable place to stay while also having the uh, teachings and support of their elders. Squatch Eyes Lodge is actually a first of its kind in Canada. It's a indigenous um, hotel that also has a fair trade gallery where indigenous peoples who are homeless on the street can come and stay there and have their art sold as a means of, of uh, revenue for themselves. I gave a few gifts out and I was wearing a lanyard earlier. Uh, it's a beaded lanyard that indigenous women who are recovering from violence uh, they bead these while they talk because it's very tough to talk about some of the things that happen to our women. And so keeping their minds and their eyes busy on beading while they talk has found to be a wonderful way for them to open up and to start to heal. Um, and Squatch Eyes supports some of those programs. If you're ever in Canada, ever in British Columbia, happy to connect with you. We were happy to have Jamie Chalker and uh, Michael Fotherington from A Hurry come over and share with them all of the things that we're doing, not only in Canada, but especially here in British Columbia. So the other concept that you've heard me say, and I'll say it again and again and again, for Indigenous, by Indigenous, is a concept that was founded by AMA and is led by the Canadian Housing and Renewal Association. As the first in our country, AMA, second to the Aboriginal Housing Office here in New South Wales, we continually act as a voice and advocate for urban Indigenous housing providers and their communities. They are the experts and we take our lead from them. Here's just some quick facts regarding uh, some of the issues that we're facing in Canada. You'll see that, again, there is more that unites us than divides us. We have more in common uh, in Canada as we do in Australia, as we do in New Zealand. Essential to our success has been the uh, willingness of our municipalities. All levels of government have come to work with, with the Aboriginal Housing Management Association, but it took us 25 years of, of evolution to get to a point where we actually have a seat at the table and we get invited by various municipal leaders, provincial leaders, and national leaders to speak about what's happening. Essential to our success has been the strong support and willingness of our provincial government to keep us at the table. Strong partnerships with the provincial government, such as Selena Robinson here, she's the woman that's beside me. Uh, the others are my board president, our Indigenous Strategic Relations Manager, and my Director of Public Affairs. Minister Selena Robinson has been adamant on keeping us at the table when it comes to addressing Indigenous housing solutions in the province of BC. I did give to Kristen some fact sheets from the province of British Columbia. It might be helpful for some of you that are working in government, some of you that are working in the leadership role in terms of ad advocating for Indigenous housing, uh, some fact sheets and press releases that talk about some of the good work that we've been doing with the province of BC. Despite the fact that we have this good relationship, I need to say that we are still having to work hard with this province. While we have a seat at the table, we are not always truly and meaningfully consulted. But there is a genuine passion and interest from our minister to work with AMA in the creation of a new agreement that defines process and protocol. We have insisted repeatedly to the, to the minister and to the directors of our Provincial Housing Corp that if we do not have a voice in how these solutions go to ground, then you are just checking a box. So we are working together to create a process and protocol agreement. There is no doubt in my mind that in Canada, BC is a leader. The recent Indigenous Housing Fund is a demonstration of their willingness to find creative solutions in supporting Indigenous peoples in BC. The Indigenous Housing Fund under Minister Selena Robinson, for the first time in the country of Canada, and I would hedge to guess first time anywhere in the world, a province took their, their provincial dollars and invested in the on-reserve community. Uh, in Canada, that's typically overseen only by the federal jurisdiction. 
our minister said that she could not be the minister of a province and see what is happening on the reserves in our province without doing something to address it. So in the last Indigenous Housing Fund, they committed to 29 housing providers in the province of BC who live on reserve to put new housing to ground in their communities. The next step for them is to have AMA actually lead the solutions in a culturally safe and meaningful way. I didn't realize I actually moved ahead. Uh, here is Minister Duclos. He is the federal uh, minister for housing for the government of Canada. Uh, our role is to advocate on behalf of our members to all levels of government. I have had formal meetings with Minister Duclos, and like a thorn in his side, I make every effort to show up where he is speaking. <laughs> this is one example. <laughs> and I speak to the need for the federal government to recognize that our urban, rural, and northern Indigenous people need to have a funding focus in and of themselves in the National Housing Strategy. <clears throat> oh, I think my slides are mixed up. That was supposed to be the last one. Okay, so here's our National Housing Strategy. I'm not going to go over the details with it. Again, I, I'll make sure that a link to the National Housing Strategy is put uh, onto the website. But suffice it to say, when the federal government got out of the housing game in the 1990s, they put together this National Housing Strategy in the last 18 months. So for the first time in decades, we actually have a National Housing Strategy. And it's a good foundation. One key measure in the National Housing Strategy, again, here's just some of the details. It was unveiled in November of 2017. They went through two years of consultation before they unveiled that. They also included Indigenous consultation through their two years of cons consults across the province. So you can see they're investing in existing stock, rent subsidies, and new housing. But one of the key ones that just got passed before they, they adjourned for the summer was the right to housing legislation and new accountability measures that go with it. We as Indigenous housing providers wait with bated breath to see the full implications of that for the battle that we have. I said earlier that the National Housing Strategy consultation process included consultation with Indigenous peoples. They unveiled this in November of 2017 Noticeably lacking was any mention of Indigenous housing solutions. So two years later, I start to think that the federal government may be working on Indian time. <laughs> Currently, they are in negotiations with three distinction-based consultation rounds, First Nations, typically on reserve, Inuit, and Métis. For those of you that may not be familiar, the Métis are descendants from the French colonization and mixing with the first regional First Nations uh, where the French colonizers settled. AMA and the CHRA lobby hard for recognition of a fourth group of people, the urban, rural, and northern indigenous peoples. We constitute 80% of all First Nations, Inuit, and Métis, and yet we do not have a voice at the table with the federal government. The 80% of the population that live outside of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit communities are there as a direct consequence to systemic colonial practices. Residential schools, Indian day schools, 60s scoop, I'm a product of the 60s scoop. I was literally taken away on the birthing table from my birth mom and never united with my home community. The existing Indian Act, it still exists. They have an act in Canada to govern us Indians. And I know that uh, just this past month, one of our members, Sharon McIver, has spent years battling the federal government on the Indian Act to give rights back to Indigenous women who had their status stripped from them because of consequences of the Indian Act. So this isn't something that, you know, is 100 years old and, you know, we should get over it. This is an act in Canada that is still in place. 
and it is a direct consequence of why we have 80% of dispossessed people living in urban, rural, and northern communities. I cannot emphasize enough, the system has to change. It will take purposeful and mindful decisions to change this. The status quo is not okay. So why does a distinct urban Indigenous housing strategy matter? I'm not going to read these statistics for you. We all know that in any country where colonization has occurred, the Indigenous peoples rank the highest on the worst scales. Uh, I learned this at, when I was at a conference in New Zealand in 2012, uh, the International Initiative on Mental Health Leadership, where they defined that the impact of colonization on Indigenous peoples needs to be looked at from a broader perspective uh, along the mental health continuum. Essentially, we see that Indigenous people rank the highest in poverty, homelessness, incarceration, violence, early deaths, and child apprehension. The only true solution will be led by Indigenous people for Indigenous people. So our argument with the federal government is that they need to have a separate stream to address the urban Indigenous. So one of the last concepts I'm gonna talk about here is leading the change. It's about changing mindsets at all levels, at community, all levels of government, and internationally. Helping people understand that the systems with which we live in, the governmental systems with which we live in, need to change. Their approaches need to change to ensure that Indigenous people get a, a true sense of belonging. Here is the uh, picture of our announcement of the Indigenous Housing Fund held on traditional Katsi First Nations. They were one of the successful First Nations to receive funding in the province of BC. As a consequence of this Indigenous Housing Fund, 52 new housing developments have been put to ground. 2,497 units will transfer under AMA's various funding streams. So before I close, here are a couple of quick slides of some of the quick successes as a consequence of our work with the province of BC. And again, happy to share the link with you so you can read up on some of these innovative solutions. I said to you before, we have a seat at the table, but we don't have a sense of belonging. This quote is very apropos for anybody working in government, anybody working in your housing authority, fighting for the rights for Indigenous peoples. Diversity is having a seat at the table, inclusion is having a voice, but belonging is having that voice be heard. I'm just gonna conclude with one more sentiment that I hold dear to my heart. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. That was written by Marianne Williamson. And so to my brothers and sisters here in Australia and in New Zealand and in any other part of the country, Put aside your fear and soldier on. Toyaksim, thank you.